Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. A pleasure to have you here with us in London for the Film Festival. Maybe you could begin with a brief introduction to the film. Tell us a bit about the story and what people can expect when they watch it. Klinsky's Kingdom, our, our film here, is based on the classic Michael Morpurgo novel of the same name. Um, a sort of beloved novel, really. It's been read by so many kids over the years. And very briefly, it's about a, a young boy who is about 11 years old, he goes on a sailing trip with his family and inadvertently falls overboard with his dog and gets swept away and washes up on a desert island and is hopeless at surviving as an urban kid would be and nearly dies in fact until he finds that he's not alone on the island and there's an old Japanese man there who's also been washed up on the island but many decades before and they have to learn to get along and share this island together and that's what the film's about, and that's all we will tell you because it will spoil you to tell more. And tell us a bit about the genesis of the project. You know, when did you first decide that this book was going to work so well on, on, on screen, and how did you do, adapt it? Well, the initial producer, Sarah Radcliffe, uh, optioned the book about 20 years ago. She loved the book and had long been a dream of hers to turn it into a film. She made many, many films. Her background was in live action, and they were going to, they did a whole pass of a live action script and but in the end it was going to be too complicated to film orangutans for real have children in the water children on the washed up on an island in peril it was just going to be too complicated so she had the brilliant idea of maybe we could do it in animation i had just done some work for the world wildlife fund and she saw that and then she approached me and said would you be interested in this project and i was working with neil at the same time and i said look this is great animator director writer can he come on board? And, and she said, sure. We pitched our version of the story to her. We did it actually by, we did a 15 minute version with music actually. We, we referenced loads of images off the internet of what the scenes and then cut it all to music so that she could sit and watch or feel the tonal element of the film rather than just see a bunch of images. And, and when she saw the sort of tonal shifts through the music, it really sold it to her. So it was a very effective way of pitching a story. And in 15 minutes, she said, this is great. I love it that you're on board. How would you characterise the style of animation? Because, of course, I feel like there's been quite an evolution. You know, things have gone, you know, right through to purely uh, uh, computer animated. Then people have kind of brought back maybe some more traditional styles. How, how would you characterise yours? Well, it is a 2D hand-drawn animated film in the classic style, but it's all done on the computer. People are drawing directly onto the screen. But we're also incorporating a lot of techniques there's a lot of 3D elements in there, but we've sort of hidden it so it still looks 2D. There's a whole blend of things in there, photos, footage. We've composited it and treated it so a way that still looks classic, but it's just added something extra to it, we think. And, um, and it's also helped us. We've used the technology to shortcut certain things because it takes a very, very long time to do animated films. And because we're an independent film, it's a very compressed schedule. So you need to sort of think about how you can use technology to do things faster. So we've done a lot of that. And there's just an absolute charm to hand-drawn animation, though. There's, we wanted to, we didn't want to go high-tech or too slick with it. So we wanted to be, a, you know, you, you know that you're looking at drawings, but somehow or other those drawings are manip uh, manipulating your emotions is the thing we were going for. But we, were, we made our animators work quite hard because we never wanted it to be cartoony. So you really got to feel that these characters could starve to death, they could die, they could really get injured. So our animators were always drilled, nothing cartoony, nothing cartoony, always entertaining, but, something, but it has to be something that's naturalistic and believable. So everyone worked very hard to achieve that sense of believability in the story. And tell us a bit about your voice cast. You know, did you already have people in mind right from the beginning? How did you get them on board and how did you work with them? I, we have a fantastic voice cast. I mean, my goodness, we couldn't believe how lucky we were. It, it, all first choices. I mean, it was brilliant. I, I think a lot of them came on board because they liked the script very much. And almost all of them had read the book or had read the book to their kids in terms of the older actors or the younger actors had read it themselves at school and they all went I love that book I want to be in the film yeah we have uh, Sally Hawkins Killian Murphy uh, Rafi Cassidy Aaron McGregor who's a brilliant young rising actor uh, who plays Michael and then unbelievably Ken Watanabe who is our Kensky who is we were blown away when you know he, he agreed to be part of the film and what a cast we were so lucky
And, and what is that process like? I know usually it's like taking one by one, isn't it, and doing their parts? Did you have them all in the room together? How did you work on the characters for them? Well, recording the actors is slightly tricky because we were, at least the first time we recorded them in COVID situations with lockdown. We did actually manage to get into the studio with Rafi and with Aaron and get them together. And we did manage to get into the studio with Sally. Killian was in Dublin. Um, so we did a remote thing with him. We could still chat to each other and so on via screens, but you know, we had to remote. And Ken was in, uh, in Japan. So we got up at some insane time in the morning and recorded him and he was brilliant. So they are recorded separately, but we, we, when we do animation, we do like a storyboard of it and we film it as an, it was called an animatic and put, uh, uh, sound effects and rough music on it and so on. So we would show them before they recorded anything visually what was about to happen so they would know that for example they're yelling 20 feet across the room towards someone during a storm whatever they knew how to pitch their voice because they understood what was um, happening in the shot and we also got them to do things Killian was doing a line where the character takes a biscuit and he was sort of miming him he said no no get a biscuit and somebody ran out and got him some biscuits and Killian was very happy about this he's very happy to act around biscuits all the time and so he would do his line stuffing biscuits in and, we, and, and, and same with Aaron when he's drowning in the water with his agreement and his mother's agreement we would pour water over his face on some of those lines so he was really gurgling and so on so it's fun. They were a fabulous cast and very enthusiastic. Along the way, were there some really challenging moments or did you have like a real highlight, something you really loved? The main challenge, I think, is always the schedule. There's always too much to do in too little amount of time. And that's just so the, so the, the sort of almost the creative art of feature films, almost by its definition, is, is compromised to a certain degree. Where do you this is to use a phrase that Neil's old mentor Richard Williams, a great animator who taught Neil how to animate, and Neil told me this great phrase he had, which is about the golden bricks philosophy. It's like, you can't have a whole wall of golden bricks, that'll never happen. So where are the key parts to choose to put your golden bricks in the film? And therefore you just, you, you, you plot all that stuff out before you've even started. Like, you know, what are the impo most important scenes? That's where we focus all of our energy on. You therefore have to sacrifice something else a little bit somewhere else. That's just the name of the game. And that's obviously painful to, to, to everybody, but it's also, the right thing to do and that's you know a, a key creative lesson to learn in, in film in, in feature filmmaking so but the schedule is the main thing i guess in terms of we did make a first pass of the animatic which is you know we were saying you know you still we, we broke it into acts we made four acts and then made each one of those and we thought all those are working brilliantly and then we this is a christmas maybe 2020 i can't remember what it was but exactly but we, 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 we finished the final one and put it all together and we were thinking, this is going to be great. It's going to have some sort of greater than some, some of its parts effect and it's going to be magical. We washed it and it, didn't, it wasn't working. It felt like Michael had been on the island for three days or something rather than six months. It's like, oh God. We went into that Christmas feeling a little bit depressed, me and Neil, almost thinking, you know, maybe she'll get a new job or something. But then we thought, no, we're going to, this, this is solvable. What does it need? And we, we fixed it and then, you know, because that's basically what you're doing the animatic for, is to work out whether the story's working in the cheapest possible way, storyboards and temporary music and dialogue. You stand back, like it's like, it's like sculpture, you know, you're chiseling on it, then you stand back and see if it's working. And when it's not, you go work out how to fix it. And we did fix it, but, um, and there were lots of highlights. I mean, uh, I mean, working with very, very talented animators and creative people and, and composers who, who deliver beyond your expectation, uh, you know, on, on a regular basis is, is really fantastic. Um, and there's lots of scenes that, even in the animatic stage, where we were showing it to people, the BFI and, and whoever, and, and they were crying just from the animatic, and when you knew it was working, and those kind of things are like, oh my god, this is great. Building on what Kurt was saying, one of the, the biggest challenges of this story is that it's a film about people who f can't communicate with language. They can't speak to each other. The little boy in the film speaks English, Kensky, the old Japanese man, can only speak Japanese, and people can't speak to animals, uh, you know, verbally. So it's all a film about how do you communicate with people when you can't talk. So we stripped a lot of dialogue out and working with Frank Cottrell, Bryce, the screenwriter as well, stripped the dialogue out. And then our challenge, which I think is the thing I'm most proud of in the film, is how do we communicate all these very complex emotions without people really uttering very many words at all. And so working with our composer, Stuart Hancock, and our, and our sound designer, Will Cohen, and all our animators who look for body language and facial expressions, and, and, and uh, uh, um, Mike Shorten, our art director, who designed the island, and you know what color the sky was that day and how that had an effect on you psychologically. 
we used all this sort of great box of tricks that you have uh, at your disposal as, a, as an animator to tell the story with the minimum of dialogue. And so that was the big creative challenge. And then when we finally showed the film and, and sat there with an audience and, and we did have people crying, which was brilliant. We're like, oh my God, that, that was like the, the greatest. We've just felt so great because all these artists had come together and had successfully told this story with very, very little dialogue. So that was great. What do you hope people take away from watching it? And I guess there's always that slight pressure, is it? When it's a, a book that's so loved, um, you know, you want to match what people have in their heads, but you also maybe have to not worry about that too much and just go with your creative instincts. So, you know, what do you hope people take away? Well, I think we want people to come out of the cinema feeling... I mean, we grew up on things like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Back to the Future and stuff like that, which are crowd-pleasing films, but they're intelligent films that work whether you're eight years old or 80 years old or whatever. So we always wanted it to be a genuine family film that all generations could enjoy. And we want it to be fun and we want it to be an adventure. But we also wanted there to be a, 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 an ecological message, timely ecological message in there, reflecting Michael Morpurgo's passions, you know, about how people, we all need to be a little bit more responsible towards the environment and, and the animals in our world. So hopefully adventure, but also a great message. And do you want to say anything about being in London for the film festival with the film? Yes, I mean, Lon being in the London Film Festival is fantastic for us because, you know, this is our hometown. I mean, uh, my adopted one and, and, and Neil was born here. And uh, we've both been coming to the London Film Festival and to South Bank in particular, where our film's showing at the IMAX. We've been coming here for decades. So, and when we were younger, obviously, you know, we were always inspired by the things we saw here and to have our own film finally on here. And we, we did a sound check at the IMAX the other day just to make sure everything was OK. And it is unbelievably big in there. So uh, it's, it, was, it was very much looking forward to seeing it uh, next weekend. So it's a great thrill. I could just say I'm, we're, we're, it's, 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 it's exciting. It, it's, it's living the dream, to use the cliche. It's brilliant to be here. Oh, that's a good note to end on. Thank you so much for sharing all that with me. I really Thank enjoyed you. presenting the film here. Thank you.